Good evening, everyone. Um, okay, we're going to start. Um, it's uh, as it's an Anglo crowd. I th we're just giving it the ten minutes uh, late start rather than allow for twenty minutes, half an hour. Um, it's traditional Israeli, <laughs> Israeli um, late start. Um, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow here at the Begin Center. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for what I think will be a fascinating discussion. Um, I'm sure some of you know the center. I recognize some faces. Some of you were even at an event we did last week. Um, and you'll know that we hold a number of events in English over the course of the year, um, all in some way connected to the, uh, the legacy of Israel's sixth prime minister, Menachem Begin. We, yeah, this, yeah, this one, this one is, is, is more directly connected than some of the others, that's true. This is very directly connected to Menachem Begin. Um, and just before, uh, before I introduce um, our, our, our speakers, um, I just want to mention that, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but Begin has been invoked a fair bit during this election season by a number of different um, politicians from a number of different parties. Uh, and they've cited him as a model of leadership or a model of integrity, um, depending on the, on the party and the point they want to make. Um, but also, interestingly, as a peacemaker, um, which is interesting, I think, because for the last 30 years or so, um, the, the, the conversation about peace and peacemaking has tended to focus on uh, the left in Israel. Um, Rightly or wrongly, that's tended to how that's that's how it's been. Even in the t even the terminology is even the terminology is partisan. Right, talk about the peace camp, right, which is the the, the, the left block headed by the Labour Party. And um, I'm not making a partisan point. I think that m most Israelis, if not all Israelis, want peace. It's just a question of of how we get there and and what we're prepared to to give up in in, in return for it. Um, but I think today there is a greater appreciation of Menachem Begin and his extraordinary achievement 40 years ago um, making peace with Israel's, at the time, greatest enemy. Um, and he did so, as we will hear, uh, out of a genuine and long-held desire for peace and uh, coupled with a determination not to cross the red lines that he saw as protecting the vital interests of Israel and the Jewish people. And whatever the outcome of next week's election, we should all hope for Israeli leadership that follows Begin's example of firm convictions and also the pragmatism required to seize historic opportunities. Okay, so we're going to start tonight's proceedings by hearing from Professor Gerald Steinberg, the founder and president of NGO Monitor, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, and professor of political studies at Baradan University. He's written op-eds um, in a number of different uh, publications, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, Jerusalem Post, Haaretz. He's appeared as a commentator on the BBC, CNN, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, and NPR. Um, and he'll be talking primarily about his new book uh, with uh, Dr. Ziv Rabinovitz, who unfortunately is not with us this evening. Um, but his new book is uh, Menachem Begin and the Israel-Egypt Peace Process. Um, it's extremely relevant for this institution. It's extremely relevant for the anniversary that we are celebrating. And I welcome Professor Steinberg. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dan Meridor and uh, Ron Lehrman for joining us this evening and all of you. It's an honor for me, a privilege to be here to speak about not only 40 years since the signing of the peace treaty, but in uh, marking the publication of a book that took 15 years to write. And I want to tell you a little bit about the process of writing and some of the, um, I won't say innovations in the book, but some of the main points that are um, discussed and developed in the book that I wrote with uh, Ziv Rubinovitz uh, over this period of time. The project began about 15 years ago. Usually books don't take that long to write. Uh, I was asked by, uh, at that time, uh, by uh, Hertzi, by actually it was Harry Horowitz, who was the, uh, the, f the founder of the uh, Begin Center and really built it, and it was, we were still sitting, uh, Israel Maidad probably remembers, we were sitting in an office in the, uh, by the uh, Binyanei Uma, in a small office, and there were pictures, or uh, sketches on the wall of this building, and I thought this was a fantasy, that this was actually gonna get built. And at the same time, I had spoken at a conference at Bar Ilan, at, just before that, which was marking 25 years of the peace agreement, 
And uh, they said to me, Harry said to me, uh, we need somebody to write a book that would document the role of Begin in the negotiations, something like that. And we thought that you would be the appropriate person to do this. I was told later that was uh, Yechel Kadishai's uh, idea. And uh, being, in those days I would say younger at least, and uh, perhaps uh, overly simplistic, I agreed to do it. I thought it was a good idea, a good challenge. Like building the building, the book also was something that uh, was, could be delayed, would be, take a long time to do. And uh, I thought it was interesting to do because I, mean, I realized then, I realized at the time that I gave that talk on the 25th uh, anniversary of the peace treaty, that unlike all of the other major actors, particularly unlike the Americans, but also we have, uh, I would say, facsimiles on the wall, Moshe Dayan, the Israeli actors, Moshe Dayan, and Ezra Weitzman in particular, but also many of the other people who were involved in the negotiations wrote memoirs. Menachem Begin did not leave us memoirs. When he left government suddenly, resigned in 1983, after the signing of the peace treaty, after all the implementation, after the Lebanon war, he did not, with one exception, did not give interviews, and that exception, the interview with Dan Patir, has not been published. So basically, while everybody else was telling their stories, and everyone else was explaining how they were the heroes of the negotiation, Jimmy Carter and his aides, Moshe Dayan, Ezra Weitzman, and other Israelis, Begin's story was never told. And the dominant picture that many Israelis had and that I had, or I was, as I taught and as I uh, was involved in the academic and, and public discussions, one of the dominant books in this was written by an Israeli journalist, Uzi Benziman, and the headline was, in Hebrew, Rosh Mem Shalab Ben Matzor, the pri a prime minister in, uh, in captivity or in, um, in this, it's under siege. And that was the dominant image. And as we began to see the documents, and they have been coming out much more regularly in the last five years, the protocols of the meetings, the cables that were sent throughout this negotiation period, certainly one does not see a prime minister under siege as a prime minister incapacitated. So not having Begin's own words and own memoirs his own history of what happened was really creating a situation where the standard approach, the standard analysis, the standard histories were very much lacking and distorted. And that became the approach that I took and then later on when Zeev joined the research about five or seven years ago that we put into this book. The book is trying to present Begin's words as well as possible from the documents that we had. The archives are extremely rich, and we were lucky in the sense that the Israeli state archives in particular, but also other sources, of course, the Begin Center's own archives, and at the same time, some of the American material that had not been released was also being put out, was also being published, that we were able to put together what I think is a much more complete picture of Begin's role, not as a prime minister under siege, but as a prime minister who was very much battling between the different concerns, the different principles, the subtitle of the book is between ideology and political realism, and that is something that is very much reflected in the documentation that we have, uh, were able to add to the book. The book, by the way, is not yet available. I, I'm sorry for those of you who thought that they would be able to purchase one. Uh, the center is, or, is ordering or has ordered a, a large number that will be available in the bookstore. But we thought with 40 years anniversary now and so much discussion of the process that this was an appropriate time to present the findings and the, the research and to have a public discussion. Also, we had two in Hebrew, have one in English on the, uh, the contribution of Menachem Begin and how the peace process came to be. So... That was the, in a sense, that was the guiding theme of the research. It is about Begin, and it's not retelling the entire story of the negotiations, but particularly from the Israeli and from Begin's perspective and as the record <coughs> documents. So in addition to the book, we also have a website. There are thousands of pages of documents, and that was one of the reasons it took 15 years, that reflect on the, the process that are integral to the process since Israel Medad is sitting here, one of the uh, important 
milestones in writing the book was the book that you put together of the letters between uh, Begin and Sadat over this period. Again, it does not show a prime minister under siege, and it also, that collection of letters was also instrumental in presenting an image of Begin that was very different than the standard approach that was taken by Jimmy Carter in particular, uh, and uh, who presented the process in particular in the period of Camp David, which I'll talk about it in a couple of minutes, as one in which Begin and Sadat were not speaking to each other, were not able to negotiate, and therefore the image that Carter presents of himself as having been, I'll use this word carefully, the savior, the person who came in, the peacemaker. And that is the image that Carter and his entourage, and it's quite uh, formidable, uh, and indeed what his, one of his main um, um, aides in the National Security Council being with the Near East, William Quant, is still writing the same uh, version of Carter as the peacemaker and as Begin as the reluctant peacemaker. That's another image that we have from the American side in particular, Begin as the reluctant peacemaker, and again, the record certainly does not show that. So what does the record show, and what's, what's the content within the book? And I'll do this, obviously, very quickly. I'm going to have to check my watch periodically, because this is not an hour and 30-minute class, and uh, we'll make this relatively short, and, and uh, here's some very interesting perspectives. I obviously was not involved in, in that at all. The, I heard Begin speak once in 1971. I came here as a student in 1971, and... We heard a number of Israeli political leaders, and one evening we had the uh, we were invited to in a small, relatively small room, to hear the leader of the opposition, and the uh, member of the faculty of Hebrew University in the introduction made the side comment that he is the, the perpetual leader of the opposition. He'll never become prime minister, but you should hear him anyway. <laughs> that was six years, and in 1971, I can understand why, in a certain sense. The we have as I think is necessary. The book is in English and it is for students, for faculty members, for researchers. It's published by Indiana University Press and with all of the standard academic processes. So we have to present background, obviously, a background which people who are Israelis, who know the history, background of, of Begin growing up, Begin in the uh, revisionist movement, Begin in Jabotinsky, that's a chapter which more or less doesn't break any new ground but summarizes the key points. Where I think the book begins to develop the, the narrative is 1967 and the Six-Day War, the build-up to the Six-Day War, a fascinating period in which uh, Begin becomes for the first time legitimate. Begin was kept out by Ben-Gurion as policy, neither Kherut nor uh, communist, communist Maki could be part of the government. He wouldn't even use Begin's name at, at, at certain periods. But in 1967, in the crisis, the week before the war, Begin not only was part of the process, he, I won't go into all the details now, but putting together the national unity government that took over, but also became a minister without portfolio for the first time. And we have a lot of, there we have a lot of his own personal memoirs of that period and the role that he played within the government. And... For our purposes, there were two major principles which more or less carried through with changes. There's an evolution, but you can see those principles develop in the meetings of the cabinet immediately after the, the fighting ended. One of the principles, because the main discussion was around the question of land for peace, and if you have an image of Begin as a reluctant peacemaker, as a uh, right-wing fanatic, one also that is not applicable, of course, if we're looking at from 2019, looking back to 67, the images are completely different. But if you had that image of Begin as implacable, Begin was part of, I think everybody in the cabinet agreed to a form of land for peace, particularly with respect to Egypt. That was a principle that was adopted and agreed upon. And Syria. Sorry, and Syria. on international borders, which we won't get into now. But that was a, but Begin's point was, and that became, that was developed further throughout that period, a peace agreement means real peace. Not a partial peace, not a non-belligerency agreement. And as Begin developed throughout that period, and when he resigned from the government in 1970, over the Rogers Plan, over other uh, incremental moves that were made, 
There are also domestic political reasons, which are part of the story. And later on throughout that period, when he was back as head of the opposition until 1977, through the election campaigns, it was always a principle of his that peace had to be made on the basis of a full and uh, legally binding peace agreement. As exists between other, I will use this term, I'm not sure it's the term he used, other normal states. Not partial. And when you see Begin negotiating throughout the period before Sadat came, and I'll talk about that in a minute, through the signing of the treaty in March of uh, 1979, that principle was something in which he would not in any way compromise. And he achieved that goal. Formal peace treaty with exchange of ambassadors, with transportation, communication, cultural elements to it, were central and very much part of Begin's vision. That did not change. This was not a reluctant peacemaker, but rather someone who had principles, had a, had a vision, had a perspective. Israel, as a country, like other countries, needs to be respected by other countries, and peace agreements must be made on that basis. And you see throughout the process Begin insisting on that as central to the agreement, to the very end, until he achieved that. The second element, and in some ways that's where the tension is and that's where a lot of the negotiations took place, was the ideological element. And that meant no foreign sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. That begins in the period after the 67 war. That's not Egypt and Syria, not the Jordanian option, but no foreign sovereignty, not annexing. He was aware of what we now call the demographic issue and certainly of the democratic issue. Begin was very much uh, focused on that. But at the same time, no foreign sovereignty. When we get to the negotiation period, particularly after, Saddam, after Sadat comes on a Motzei Shabbat in 1977, in November 1977, and lands at Ben Gurion Airport. And that was, again, a major, major event. That didn't happen because Sadat decided to come and nothing else was important, as is often portrayed. But the period from the first day that Begin became prime minister until the arrival of Sadat, and of course afterwards, Begin was very carefully making sure that and promoting that process. I don't think there was any way that Begin could have anticipated that actually this would happen in the way that it did. But every, he, he immediately began to sound out the interlocutors that had spoken to Sadat, Ceausescu in Romania. It's probably the only good thing that anybody will say about Ceausescu. <laughs> but Sadat had been in Romania before the election. And in fact, at the time, Prime Minister Rabin had been invited to go and meet with Ceausescu and listen to the uh, proposal that Sadat had made. Rabin did not go had elected to wait, uh, maybe the term elected is a little bit problematic, until after the elections, expecting, to, of course, that the Labour Party would be re-elected. Shlomo Avineri, who was at that time the Director General of the Foreign Ministry, went. And Begin got, not only from the Romanian ambassador within the first couple of weeks of being in, in office, but also from Shlomo Avineri and other people involved in the previous contacts that had been made with Sadat over a possible furtherance of the peace process. Begin immediately became very expert in all of this and asked for more and more information. He also immediately opened up a channel in those days with the ambassador from the United States, Sam Lewis, in order to see what the Americans were knew about bringing in Sadat into a process of negotiation. And then when those steps had been taken and Begin had gone to the White House, gone to, to Romania, become very much familiarized with the process, sent signals of Sadat. Then we have the beginning of a series of secret negotiations, uh, feelers that were between Moshe Dayan, the certainly in terms of if you're looking for a peace treaty, very appropriate choice for foreign minister, one that is still criticized within the now that he could uh, on the right for having taken someone who was so much a bastion of the, the former uh, but Mapai Marach Labour Party uh, structure and making him the foreign minister because he had the connection, the experience. Met with Sadat's uh, right hand uh, aide, Tahumi, Tuami, Tuhami, and uh, had a series of negotiations. Sadat, Begin, or Dayan? Dayan, 
Dayan met with him, okay. but so, but under Begin's not just um, direction and but also in terms of very very being very much involved in the process, and that set the stage. There were a series of speeches uh, in which Sadat talked about coming to Jerusalem, and at each stage, Begin responded positively and made sure that the message was sent to Sadat that if he were to come, he would be more than welcomed, and all of the uh, the appropriate uh, diplomatic steps would be taken. And that would be beginning beginning of negotiations. There's a debate about whether, in fact, the full withdrawal of Israel from Egypt was already agreed upon in the meetings between Diana and Tuami. Uh, it's, we did not find documentary evidence of that, but certainly when Sadat came, one could have expected that that was more or less that was what the discussions were around. It was difficult and it was painful. <clears throat> So when Sadat arrives, we begin the negotiations. There's a very, another very important element of all of this, and that is the fact that although Carter had very much tried to push Sadat and Begin into the next round of the Geneva Conference, which had started under Kissinger and was basically formal, formalistic and formalistic in order to reach the, uh, or to seal the separation agreements, the Carter government wanted to, the Carter administration, wanted to give this Geneva process a lot more substance. And the way it was presented was it would be a joint American-Soviet initiative. And that was one of the points that united Begin and Sadat. Now, Begin had been in, a so, in, the, in the Gulag. He had been a prisoner of the Soviets. For no, anyone can, you, this book is also, I think it's available here still, White Knights. This was not something that Begin and anybody who knows about looking at his history, foreign policy statements all the way through, the Soviets were not at all to be trusted as, I think, an understatement. It was also something Sadat did not want. He had just gotten rid of the Soviets. He didn't want to invite them back into the region. And that was a point of close agreement between Sadat and Begin. We're going to do this, but we're going to do it without the Soviets, without Geneva, and if we have to, which they did at the beginning, without Carter, without the Americans. And so we have the beginning of the process without the United States. It became complicated after the initial meetings to work out the negotiations. The Americans were the, um, the obvious third party that could provide both the, the process that needed to be done and also the substance in terms of providing uh, alternatives to the bases, uh, the Israeli bases in the Sinai to build the base, to provide the economic assistance, the military assistance to be guarantors. But that came after the visit. Begin had to manage this very complicated relationship with Carter throughout the process. And a great deal both of the book, but also of the, it does reflect the, the uh, ups and downs. Why did it take, on the one hand, uh, a year and a half to reach a peace agreement from November 77 through March 79? Or the alternative could be, how are they able to do this in such a short period of time? Because through, this is something, and I say this as an academic, this is an academic audience when I speak about this in an academic audience, the point that I begin with is that this is something extremely unusual almost unprecedented in the post-war period that countries, neither of whom conquered the other one, neither of whom were able to impose their power on the other one, were able to reach an agreement. And here we are 40 years later. The agreement is still extremely important to both countries. How did that process take place? What are the characteristics of that? And you have to look both at, at the both at the countries and also the individuals and the way in which they perceived what they saw as the national interest and their political interest in the process. Part of that, one of the most difficult elements, and for part of the negotiations, for the second half of the negotiations, from Camp David, the negotiations reached a, I won't say an impasse, but they became extremely difficult and there were a lot of conflicts over the months after Sadat's visit. And through the American insistence and pressure, and through the process of aids both to Sadat and to, uh, to Begin, particularly Dayan, the process was, I would say, um, put back on a, a positive track. There was a Leeds Castle meeting a few weeks before, and then Camp David began at the end of August of uh, 1978. It lasted for two weeks, and nobody expected it to last that long. Also, 
most of the main players did not, and they wrote this in their memoirs, in the case of Begin and the Israelis, in the cables and in the, uh, the, the protocols, did not expect to leave Camp David with a set of agreements. The best that anybody expected was that there would be, number one, some sort of a uh, basis for an agreement, and number two, certainly the Israelis, Begin was very concerned that if it failed, Israel would not be blamed. And he had to manage the relationship with Carter, and that's I want to end on this point because I think it's extremely important as part of the, the history. Not only was Begin able to reach an agreement with Sadat of historic importance, and given all the difficulties that were involved, and the fact that domestically he was called a traitor, he was ridiculed, or I think that the, he was um, very much uh, the subject of intense demonstrations, he's the only Israeli, the only Zionist leader who agreed to take down settlements that had been built. And that was, he was considered a traitor for that. He agreed to autonomy for the Palestinians. He was, by his own, his closest associates, and maybe Dan will talk a little bit about that also, in, uh, in the Cherut framework, certainly Gula Cohen, Isaac Shamir, others, who accused him of having given away vital or having violated essential Zionist principles in this process. So that was one extremely difficult process, but at the, in parallel he had to manage this very difficult relationship, this very uh, hostile relationship with Carter. From the second week of Camp David, it went on for two weeks, largely at the end of the first week, most of the bilateral issues between Israel and Egypt had been resolved. Most of the second week was consisted, and particularly towards the end, very intense fights with the Americans over the autonomy. What are we going to do about the second part of the package? The Americans went into the Carter in particular, wanted a comprehensive agreement to solve all the problems of the Middle East or of the world. And to do that, bring in Yasser Arafat, bring in the Palestinians, bring in the Jordanians, King Hussein, and let's solve all the problems. Both Sadat and Begin realized that was extremely impractical. So what it became down to was a focus on the issue of particularly Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, what Begin called uh, uh, the Arabs of Eretz Israel. The term Palestinian was not used, certainly not by Begin. Carter insisted on, he'd used the term homeland, that was the Brookings plan that Carter came in with and, and many of his aides had been part of, Brzezinski and others, national security advisor. And that was against the fundamental red line in Begin's ideology. Not a homeland, certainly not a state, not anything that suggests a relinquishing of sovereignty to a foreign entity. But autonomy, that was already discussed back after 67. Begin was not a proponent of that, but he developed it in a way that he was able to, to live with, to accept, and he was able to bring that to a fruition in the negotiations. Carter, to the very last day, insisted, pressed, demanded, pressured, threatened to get much more than that. And Begin said no. And managing that relationship, and Begin constantly throughout the protocols and the cables and the discussions that we have records of, talked about rejecting the American pressure, but maintaining the, the importance of the relationship between Israel and the United States. To manage that was extremely difficult to do. And throughout the process, we see how Begin walked that tightrope very carefully. The very last day of Camp David, this is a Saturday night, the last meeting of Camp David between Begin and Dayan and um, Aaron Barak as essentially a note taker, the, now the uh, then nominee to the Supreme Court. He was the legal advisor at the time. On Sadat's side, sorry, on, on, within Carter. Carter, William Quatt from the National Security Council, Cyrus Vance, the Secretary of State. A very long and bitter argument constant pressure throughout those hours from Carter on Begin to agree to a freeze on settlements. That was Carter's last stand in some ways on this issue. If he could get a freeze on settlements, that would then, in Carter's view, become the basis for 
developing a Palestinian homeland and for leading to the Israeli departure, the end of the occupation. And Begin said he agreed to three months. Carter wanted five years. At the end of the meeting, Begin agreed to write a letter, sent a letter Sunday morning, and Carter said, Begin lied to me. He promised me that the freeze would be through the autonomy negotiations, five years. And the letter said three months. And Carter called Begin publicly a liar, and still today calls Begin a liar. What we have are the only public notes that we know about are Barak's notes, and Barak has talked about it, and we have the notes, not legible but later on transcribed, that, that explicitly show the three months, that Begin said three months and not more. And we also have the testimony of Cyrus Vance before Congress, Ziv Rubinovitz, who joined this project uh, as I was drowning in the amount of material and the book was not going to get written and was extremely instrumental in not only obtaining the documents but deciphering them. He spent six months, not full time, but six months tracking down a statement that Cyrus Vance had made before Congress in a test congressional testimony. In those days, they were not live streamed and we don't have the, uh, we, and he had to find the, it was not even published, it was in the sense that it was a, there was a transcript, there was a stenogram. And there we see that Vance reinforces and supports Begin's and Barak's version of what happened. You can imagine the intensity of the conflict and the way it exploded. And yet, throughout this process, Begin was able to maintain the relationship, it was a very difficult relationship, but without having it explode, and leading to all sorts of uh, sanctions on, on Israel that would have been extremely damaging. So managing all of these processes together, one gets, I think, a very strong sense of Begin's role in the negotiations and the fact that we're not dealing with a prime minister who either regretted the agreement, as was said once by Sam Lewis after Camp David, or a prime minister under siege. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Professor Gerald Steinberg. Um, you very bravely, Gerald, you very bravely um, mentioned Yitzhak Shamir as a, a critic of Camp David with this picture of Shamir <laughs> behind you. I'm not sure I would have done that. Um, okay, um, Dan Murray Dorr, I'd like to invite you to, uh, to address us. Dan is a former member of Knesset. Uh, former minister in multiple governments, served as Justice Minister, Finance Minister, Minister of Intelligence and Atomic en Energy, and Deputy Prime Minister. And his political career really began when he served as Menachem Begin's Cabinet Secretary from 1982 to 1983. Um, not only then did he know Begin personally, he is also um, widely acknowledged as a genuine student of Begin's political philosophy. He's a great friend of the, of the Begin Center, and we're delighted to have him with us. Good evening, I'm happy to be here in this uh, unique place uh, that, can I say, we have been building. Harry Horowitz, Yahil Kadishai, mentioned, you've mentioned the names and other people. It's a unique place for me always. And uh, I'm happy to speak here on one of Begin's uh, most uh, extraordinary achievements, as I would try to explain. Uh, let me speak of leadership of strategy uh, and uh, policy. Leadership, uh, a product uh, in shortage these days. What does leadership mean? You know, in, in uh, Sefer Bamidbar, I think Parshat Pinchas, when Moses is going to die, uh, God tells him to look for a replacement, for somebody to replace him. And he says, look for Ish Asher Ruach Bo. Ish Asher Ruach Bo. And Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki, the great interpreter of the 10th, 11th century, says, what is Ish Asher Ruach Bo? Sheyachol lahaloch keneged ruchho shekol ish vaish. Some of you can go against the majority as a leader. Think of it, Joshua, who was elected, selected, was the, in the minority of the 12 uh, spies 
He was in the minority, he didn't have a majority. Leadership is not, I don't want to mention names, reading the polls and asking the people what they want and doing what they want. For this, you have a pollster, you don't need a leader. Leader is somebody who acts to lead the people where they wouldn't go otherwise. It's a, if you like, a tension or paradox in democracy, but democracy without a leader means you go after the lowest common denominator. And Begin here showed leadership in a very remarkable way, comparable in this room only to one person, David Ben-Gurion, who did the same thing in 1948. He so didn't ask the people whether they want or not. In the end, he had to convince, as Begin had to convince, it's democracy. But you don't start by the focus group asking people, what do you want? I'll say it and you will vote for me. He had this vision, his conviction, and as was mentioned uh, politely by, by uh, Gerald here, against most of his supporters, and led them, us, can I say, uh, to things that we didn't think were possible or right in the first place. This is a, a unique uh, character that Begin had. And uh, I, I, I want to, to, to say to you, I think I with certainty had Begin gone to the people or to the Likud party members and asked them, should I give up all of Sinai to the last inch for this paper called Peace with the Dictator called Sadat? Definitely the answer would be negative in big numbers. Moshe Dayan, the Labour Party, used to say it's better to have Shah Mashiach without peace than peace without Shah Mashiach. Igel Alon, the commander of the Palmach and one of the great leaders of the Labour Party uh, didn't vote for the agreement. They abstained. As did half, if not more, of the Herut members of the Knesset. When they, when, including our good friend, who just passed away, Misha Ahrens, Ehud Olmert, uh, Yitzhak Shamir, who abstained as the Speaker of the Knesset, and other people, other names you may not uh, even remember now. So the, 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 this vision of a person who is con convinced what is right for the people, and leads there, convincing them in the end, is unique. And we haven't seen much of it recently, not in Israel, not in other countries, where the discourse now is listening to the masses do what they want. And uh, I want to mention this point, I think it's important today. When Begin did this, uh, there was uh, an outcry from many people saying to him, what are you doing? giving away land more than twice the size of Israel that was won in a legitimate war. I was a tank commander in this war personally, remember it very well. And you give it for what? For a piece of paper? Are you crazy? It won't hold. Now looking backwards, as we can do today, 40 years after the fact, I think I can say that uh, in all Israeli history, from 1948 on, there was not one single political act with more consequence and importance strategically, historically, than this decision of Begin and the agreement with Egypt. We take it for granted now, but I remember as a soldier in reserves, as officer, low-ranking officer in the arms, armed corps, to be used to be called between, between Yom Kippur and 77, the fear, the nightmare was a, a war against all the Arabs in all fronts, which was existential dangerous. No more. The ability to take out Egypt outside the circle of hostility and belligerence and, 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 and hate broke the Arab unity against Israel. It started the process of, uh, people call it the peace process, I call it the acceptance of Israel process in the Middle East. You had Jordan later, Oslo, which I was against, but in the same direction. And then uh, other countries, not officially, but it's North African countries, Morocco, Tunisia, or Gulf states, all the way to Saudi Arabia. It all started there with this decision of a man who caught the, the importance and the, and, the, and the time that he was in power under his shift that he can change history and, and uh, accept Israel in the Middle East by its neighbors with a heavy price to be paid, of course, and risk to be taken. So definitely 40 years later, we can say this changed history, this changed the Middle East dramatically for our, uh, in our favor. Now to get this agreement, by the way, I have to add something and I agree with Gerald. I'm 
Uh, we all are pro-American. America is the greatest friend of Israel for years, since Truman to this day. <coughs> but uh, when Sadat heard in October mm -hmm. of 1977, that the American, the Russian, the Soviets are getting together. There was an agreement, joint statement by Vance and Gromyko, the two foreign ministers in New York, I think, that they are going to do it together. He said, enough of it. If the American, the Russians are in it, there won't be an agreement. And he accepted the invitations and to get directly to talk with Israel. Now, what were the main problems? Two problems. One is Egypt-Israel. What is the border? Are we going to give all of Sinai back? to the international border that was carved between Egypt and um, Egypt under the British and, and, uh, and Palestine uh, in, in 1906, I think, or 9, international boundary or not. The general concept is there was land for peace, but com territorial compromise. Territorial compromise on both sides, in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and, and Sinai was the ideology of the Labour Party, of all the peace camp. Nobody there spoke of giving everything back. Begin understood, I, I know it from him, having spent so much time with him, that this will never work. The decision, decision had to be made whether we go all the way or we don't. And he felt that when he got to this minute in November of 77, that Sadat was here. To the best of my knowledge, Sadat didn't have a prior commitment. He would get everything. They were talked with Dayan, what Dayan reported, and the Mossad people <coughs> were with him. As far as I know, there was no commitment to get back to the, to the, secure, to the uh, international boundary. But in the meeting that Begin and Sadat had at King David Hotel, not far from here, he told him, you, I'm going to go back to the international boundary. All of Sinai is going back to you. And then later, Begin explained, he, he used a metaphor from, the, I think, the Greek mytho mythology, that sometimes when, when the goddess of, I think, fortune or something passes near you, you have to catch her when she's there. If you don't catch her in time, she's gone, you will never be able to get her again. So he decided, and to me, this is the, one of the most crucial decisions he made. I'm not going to, to bargain for an inch there or a dunam there or a land there. I'm going to go all the way to change history. I'm, I must say against the public uh, consent in Israel. I can speculate, I think, with some justification, there wouldn't have been a peace treaty. Had Sadat heard, no, I want this or that, it wouldn't work. Think later what happened with Taba, this tiny small thing. Everything almost collapsed because of this uh, small portion. For them, as Sadat used to say, Wallah centimeter murabba, not one square centimeter. It's sacred land. Ard Muqaddas, sacred land. And they understood that territorial compromise means no peace. And peace is of great importance, and this is the first thing he did. And the rest is history. The second thing that was mentioned, I want to dwell on for some minutes, I think is important. There was the line of Arab unity. The Arabs go together. And they don't go separately. And we tried for years to separate Egypt from the others. Rabin spoke of it openly and failed. Nobody succeeded to separate the Arab world and go with one country alone. If you want all of them together, it's easy to understand things are much harder. And specifically, the issue of Eretz Israel, or Judea and Samaria, on Gaza then, this was the core of the, of the problem ideologically, politically, what have you. How can you do it? And in fact, Kim David, uh, uh, or rather, sorry, before Kim David, when Sadat uh, came, and then Begin prepared a plan that he called the autonomy plan. Autonomy is just one part of it. I'll speak of the other part that people tend to forget or, or make other people forget. I'll come to it. It's interesting. For the resolution, the way he thought was right, on the issue of the Israeli-Palestinian or Israeli-Jewish-Arab -Jew uh, conflict within the land of Israel or Palestine. He didn't call the in Palestinian. He said Palestinian Arabs, but it's all the same. Leave terminology aside. It's not that important here. And uh, then he prepared this autonomy plan. He wrote it down, I think he dictated to Yechir Kedishai, the first, the first draft, and then they developed it. When he showed it to Dayan, Dayan said, well, it's not going to work, it's, it's a good trick. He said to Dayan, this I heard from him personally, no, I mean it, it's going to, this is what I mean to do, I'm not playing a game here. I have to say this uh, en passant, Begin was a man of his word. People who hated him and who loved him knew he was never lying. You can't find Begin lying. 
I can't say it on everybody on, the, on this wall here. He, he was serious. He wouldn't say a thing that he wouldn't do, but once he did it, he said it, it was truthful, he meant to do it. And uh, then he, he prepared this autonomy plan, pre uh, pr proposed it to the, to the inner cabinet. They approved it. He, f he flew to Carter, proposed it to Carter and his entourage, and they, he said, and they praised it. Koloroea Shibua, all that saw it, uh, praised it. And then he went back to, I think Callahan was the Prime Minister in Britain, and he showed it to him. And he came out with his plan, I want to say something about the plan. And uh, when Sadat came, again, this was, this was the basis that developed into Kim David later. What was the problem there? I, I take the ideology that is, I think is interesting. And I agree with the definition that uh, Gerald spoke of. Leadership to me, or policy making, is a marriage of the vision or ideology and reality. You never reach the peak that the ideology alone has. The vision is always greater and pinky and rosy, wonderful. Reality is tougher. So leaders who only dwell in the, in, in the, in the clouds can never do anything practical. And people who have no vision are even worse. They are stuck only where they are. So how you marry these two things? Now, one begins, if you speak of Begin and the revisionist movement, with what you may remember as Stega Dotlayer then, the two banks of the river Jordan are both ours. Jabotinsky's poem that was a song that was sung so many times. And Begin got to power in 1977. In the first speech in the Knesset, where he called Sadat to come, he offered Hussein to have a peace treaty on the border, on the, on the Jordan. In other words, he gave up on the East Bank for the first time officially. Now you have the West Bank or, or Judea and Samaria. What do we do with that? Now I quote, I think verbatim, in translation to English, what he said in the Knesset. It's an open speech, 28th of December, 77. It says, we have a right and a claim to these territories. There were two territories, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank on one side, Gaza on the other side. The PLO wasn't relevant. There was a claim of Egypt and a claim of Jordan to get back what they had, or what they occupied in any case said, we have a right and a claim to these lands. There are two other claims. He didn't say rights, Egypt and Jordan. If the claims stand against each other, they won't be in agreement. So I propose the following, and here comes his proposal. Let's leave the question of sovereignty open, word by word, and deal with the people autonomy, and he develops a very full autonomy, of, which you call self-rule. They will elect their own government. They call it administrative council by free election, the Palestinians, the Arabs, and uh, all the functions will be in their hands. They call it whatever function you think of, but no foreign affairs, that's not a state, and no security. Security will be, defense will be in our hands. This was the idea, and uh, uh, he called it self-rule in, in America and other places. But then he asked himself, but what about uh, legislation and, and, uh, and about citizenship? You, you, you have a government, what about parliament? And because he was a Democrat all through, and for him, as he called his movement, national liberal movement, Likud to this day, people forgot it in the Likud. The name is national liberal, liberal, not national, not liberal, the combination, the balance of the two, and always democratic. He said the following, every Arab in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza who will choose to do so will become an Israeli citizen, and they'll have a choice, an option. Either stay Jordanian, most of them, all of them in, in the West Bank were Jordanians, or pick Israeli, and he, he supposed that some will pick it, some will not. And he said, we will, if we don't do that, the people who lie today about begging, who use autonomy as if this was a trick, he said, if we don't do that, if we don't give them right to, to, to be Israelis and, and vote for the kids, we become Rhodesia in the inner cabinet of South Africa, and they apartheid. You can't do autonomy not to let them vote. He hoped, I suppose, this he doesn't say, that some of them will be here, some will be there, Israel and Jordan, and then he said legislation will be dealt by Israel, with by Israel and Jordan. The, the, the government of Palestinians will send a, a delegate, a, a representative to the Israeli government, to the Jordanian government, and Israel and Jordan, in a way, what, and you look at it, there's a, uh, what he proposed, an Arab state called Jordan, a Jewish state called Israel, and something in between where the sovereignty is not defined, but the functions are defined, legislation by both, 
and the people vote in both parliaments the way they choose, and they run their own affairs. This was the basic idea that he thought may work and was compatible both with security and with ideology. About ideology, I want to add this following concession that I feel he made. He never said it, but I can tell you as a person who had to vote for or against it in the Likud, in Merkaza Likud, when it came to us, Sinai was not difficult for me. I never thought, although I fought in Sinai, Sinai is part of Eretz Israel. Israeli, the Jews, um, uh, you know, uh, and moved over Sinai 40 years to get to Eretz Israel. It's not part of Eretz Israel. But the land of Israel, I was brought up to believe it's my country and time will come, we'll, we'll apply our sovereignty there. Of course, with equal rights. Nobody thought of this racist idea of some people today that they will apply sovereignty, they will never vote. This is South Africa. It's not Israel. It was not big indefinitely. But I thought in the end, like Israeli Arabs vote in Haifa, they will vote in Bethlehem and we'll have the numbers. This was the idea that Begin always spoke of. So uh, um, then he changed the, pol the, the ideologically, I think, the most uh, painful, not his words, it's my reading of it, was that rather than saying we'll apply our sovereignty to the West Bank, to the Jordan, westward of Jordan, not the East Bank on which he gave up, he said let's leave the sovereignty open. Let's just say I will, rather than I'll apply mine, Neither you nor I will apply sovereignty. I'll leave it open as long as you leave it open. At the Camp David Agreement, it took a form of an agreement, not just an Israeli commitment. There's an agreement between Israel and Egypt and America as a witness. The same thing. There they, they made it a five years agreement, and within five years they have to negotiate what comes after, but it said openly that if they don't succeed, it will stay like this. So he tried to offer a compromise Ideologically, very, very, uh, I think, deep, not, not easy at all. But this was the necessary first to get an agreement with, with Egypt, otherwise, there wouldn't have been an agreement. Second, he really thought this may resolve the Palestinian Israeli conflict. We give up, I think, a lot by saying we will not apply our sovereignty. And thank you for begging in all his six and a half years in government, didn't annex one inch of any part of Eretz Israel. Nothing. There was one annexation or, or application of sovereignty in 67 by the National Unity Government in June of 67. And there was one in the Golan Heights, which was not part of Eretz Israel historically, and they needed a different law for this. But in Eretz Israel, he left it open. I believe, understanding this is not his word, that if you want to annex it, I don't speak about the world, you lose Israeli Jewish majority, and you can't live in a South African situation that the only, only Jews will vote in some tricks. Uh, you know, um, Zionism always demanded Jewish majority, and the Arabs objected. Why? Because Zionism presumed that the Arabs vote. If they don't vote, who needs majority? To a trick by which they will not vote, and we rule, this was the opposite of Begin. And this was his idea that, that um, I thought was very innovative and, and, was, and caught the, the, the attention of leaders in the, in the world. In the end, it didn't work like all other things with the Palestinians, and we are still stuck where we are today, but uh, I don't want to go into that. So what well, I want to say that uh, in Begin, one saw, I saw a uh, leader who really saw Jewish history uh, very deep in his, in his being through Jewish history from, from the early days through the Holocaust, if you like, all the way to the um, establishment or re-establishment of a Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, a man who was considered a, a hawk, a warrior, a warmonger, if you like, uh, by all his uh, adversaries inside the Israeli camp. And he was the man who raised the, uh, his, the, the, the uh, sword of, of revolt against the British when the majority was not for that in 1943-44. And he was the one that... Uh, was able to make peace and change Israeli history the, the way he did. It's a, it's a unique um, way of life, unique experience that I don't think anybody matches it in our time. And he took a, a, a resolve that he had and the ability, the charisma he had to convince people uh, as, as he did. The uh, um, end of the story of Begin uh, as a prime minister was in '83. It has to do with the Lebanon war that was not a success story. 
and uh, I saw it firsthand because I was there. Uh, he uh, started a war that he thought would take two days, as promised by the chief of staff, 24 to 36 hours. It ended up, or it was protracted to months and years, and uh, he called it a tragedy publicly, and, and he resigned. So I don't want to make it either white or black. There was both shadows and, and, and lights. But the story of Kim David and the peace treaty that was signed and the uh, readiness to go all the way with your conviction of what is right for your people and maintain the balance of the values between the national values and the liberal values, democracy, not just it's good for us, it's just to do it, is uh, what Begin stands for, which is why maybe even today he's um, a model for many people, some of whom never met him, and some of them don't even understand what he said, but he's in such a position of love by so many people that you see in the campaigns now that many people take Begin as a background. We continue begging to some of them who would shred hearing what they say, but uh, this was a person that um, was in the right time, can I say, to change the course, course of history for Israel, and uh, 40 years now is the time we can celebrate and commemorate it. Um, I want to uh, thank Dan very much for that. That was a wonderful um, exposition and um, really added to our understanding. Um, we have a third illustrious guest this evening, Dr. Aaron Lerman, the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, a professor at Shalem College. He served as Deputy Director for Foreign Policy and International Affairs at the National Security Council and the Prime Minister's Office. He held senior posts in IDF military intelligence for over 20 years, and he's going to help us understand a little more about the current reality of Israeli-Egyptian relations and how we got here. Um, we're going to have a conversation with uh, everyone. Did you want to say a few words first? Yep. before, And then we'll have a conversation with the, the other gentleman. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, actually, my, uh, the reason I think I'm here is that my PhD is about modern Egyptian history, 1940s. And then for a while, at least, I was the uh, head of the Egyptian department, so to speak, in military, director of military intelligence. So I had Egypt on my watch. And um, I'm still uh, teaching and thinking about Egypt. I think we all should. We tend to take it for granted sometimes. We have uh, come to think of this 40 year, years of peace as a given. But if, God forbid, uh, Egypt was to fall into the wrong hands, and it nearly happened, or descend into chaos, and that also nearly happened, the consequences for our strategic environment, where we live, would be as severe as anything that uh, could happen in the Iranian context or the Palestinian context. The fact that we no longer think of Egypt in such terms is in itself a testimony to Begin's profound insight as to what was at stake and, and, and to the immense achievement of the peace treaty, the, 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 the visit, which would not have happened if Begin did not encourage it, the, treaty, the, the Camp David breakthrough and the treaty. But to understand this and to understand what's going on now between Israel and Egypt, I think we, want, we need to focus on a few substantial uh, aspects. One is that Sadat's venture, his entire project as president, was to bring Egypt back to life as Egypt. We tend to forget, but for 13 years, there was not even an Egypt on the map. The country we fought in 67 and in the War of Attrition was something called the UAR, the United Arab Republic, something that, a name that reflected Nasser's vision of what he sought, would, or thought and sought. He was after a situation in which Egypt, poor, with limited resources, would draw on the resources of the entire Arab world, including, of course, the very rich uh, Gulf region and so on, 
being not only a leader but a hegemon. And that, has, that is at the core, stood at the core of what made the conflict with Israel um, intractable, more or less intractable, uh, during the, from the rise of Nasser or the rise of Nasser's ideological commitment and uh, all the way to his death as a heartbroken man. Sadat himself described it in the last three years of his life after 67 as a dead man walking. Uh, died very young, by the way. People tend to forget he was 52 of a heart attack. And Sadat inherits a country in ruin. Three of its major cities laid waste by Israeli military action. Uh, the, the Suez Canal cities, uh, Port Said, Ismail, uh, Suez. And impoverished and, as, and in bondage to the Soviets. He rose against the British when there were thousands of British soldiers. He inherits a country from Nasser who is now, is now inundated uh, with the Soviet control and with Soviet conspiracies to, to get rid of him in favor of their men uh, in, in power. And he has ma he managed systematically to maneuver out of this. And very clearly, what he had in mind was a repositioning of a proud country. First of all, restoring the name of Egypt. From in 71, he renames the country the Arab Republic of Egypt. And he begins to indicate to the uh, Nixon administration that he's interested in breaking his bonds, in going over, in, in swimming over the river, so to speak. That didn't quite work out. Um, I'm not going to go into the history of why his feelers in 73 were not fully met. I think at the time he did not cross the last threshold of full peace. What was on offer in his, store, in, in, in his messages to the Americans was something just, just short of that. And there's a big debate going on. And there's quite a, a lot of new literature from Boinfeld and others going into the fine, fine detail of, of that troubled period. But in Begin, he found a partner, not only in terms of peacemaking, but also in terms of working to diminish Soviet power in the region. Why was he so shocked uh, about the Geneva understandings with the Soviets? Because this would have put Assad and the Soviets and the PLO in the rider's seat, with Egypt once again subservient to an Arab, Arab fantasies and Soviet manipulations. And so he found in Begin a partner who understood the basic transformation that needed, that Egypt needed um, and in terms of uh, reorienting the country. He basically did five things that were inter uh, interwoven. Peace with Israel, reorientation of Egypt's identity, al Hawi al Masriya, re restoring Egyptian identity, economic opening, reorientation uh, uh, with, uh, uh, against the, um, uh, the Soviets, so to speak. By 76, there was not even a Soviet embassy in Cairo. You know, this was 180 degrees. And a certain level of experimentation was open, more open politics within an Egyptian dictatorship. All of this uh, made the breakthrough possible. In many ways, some of these issues are still with us. We think of Egypt as a very stable place. You know, it's been... You know what they used, what they asked Sadat, what is the difference between Egypt and other, other Arab countries? He said, Egypt is a country. <laughs> <laughs> the others are tribes with flags. Uh, we think of Egypt as, as something that has been there for, uh, you know, 7,000 years. But it is a country that has gone through very dramatic transformations uh, within the last 200 years, within the last 10 years. A revolution against Mubarak, the, the re-emergence of the military in control of the country, to the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood of all people. Uh, and I see here uh, um, uh, an eight-year-old warning against the Brotherhood. Luckily, the military did not fall into the Brotherhood tra uh, trap, and uh, we ended up 
with the brotherhood thrown out. And now we have a man who in some ways tries to emulate Nasser as a, a popular tribune, as a, somebody who speaks to the Egyptian people and for the Egyptian people, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Um, but at the same time, keeps in mind Sadat's basic insight, which is that Egypt cannot sustain its dignity and identity if it wastes its, uh, if the country should once again waste its youth, its, its blood, its efforts on the conflict with Israel. He is not as honest. We know about his opinions. People have read things that he wrote when he was a student in American uh, military training programs. Um, he is no friend of ours, and the Egyptian military was not raised to think of us as a friend. They were th raised to think of us as the, en the blue enemy in military exercises, a small country to our northeast. But once he took power, he in increasingly came to some very profound observations. Sisi. First of all, what, what keeps this peace so stable? Let me offer an insight that we tend to forget with the Palestinians. And even with what once upon a time was Syria, I don't know if it's still an appropriate name. Um, we have to be frank with ourselves. We, this is not a negotiation between equals. The Palestinians are by two orders of magnitude weaker than us and the Syrians by one. You measure this, if you wish, even by the most rudimentary tool, uh, say comparing um, gross domestic product, GDP. GDP. Egypt and Israel, well, Egypt is uh, so much poorer that an Israeli makes in a month um, what Egyptians make in more than a year. But given that their population is 12 times ours, we are roughly equals. When, Begin met Sadat, when Sadat met Begin, um, this equality was restored also in, in, their, in the Egyptian mind through the consequences of the War of 73, what the Egyptians cleverly call nowadays in Tesarat October, the, the victories, because the war was lost. But they had some victories in, as they went along. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, and of course the role of the Air Force kept growing retroactively when Mubarak was president, because that was his Air Force. <laughs> but um, there was a sense that this was a deal between equals. So there was not this, this uh, very uh, convulsed relationship with, between a strong party and, 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 and a weak one. Uh, and this, is, this remains, I think, uh, a profound observation. Um, there was one obsession, by the way, that the Egypt, some Egyptians still hold that makes us, in their mind, superior to them in capabilities. That's, that's the alleged nuclear capabilities of Israel. Interestingly, in, in Camp David, um, Sadat brought first a, a draft with a clause about this, and Carter, God bless him, for all his faults, was clever enough to understand that exactly the same way that uh, Kul uh, Shibr for the Egyptians, every centimeter is holy. This is for begging the, what they call in New York a third rail. And he told him, forget about it. Don't, don't even try. And he didn't. He didn't. He took then years and years of hard work by Amro Musa for Mubarak to realize that this is also useless. And nowadays, it's, they even stopped trying to bring these issues in, in the international fora. But they do feel, they do not look upon Israel as superior. They don't, uh, they, they, it's basically the understanding that these two countries by now need each other. The deep state, anyway. That's a very Egyptian term, although it's borrowed from, originally from the Turkish concept of the deep state, but it has spread. Well, some people would argue we have a deep state here as well. Uh, but um, uh, I've heard this, and, and, uh, and I've seen this coming up in the American debate, and now about Trump and the establishment. But um, in, in Egypt, there's certainly a deep state, the military, the um, big uh, industrial interests, which are very much uh, linked to the military, 
uh, the intelligence community and, sounds familiar, the legal system. And all of them working to, to basically uh, serve the interests of the state as such. The Egyptian deep state understands the interest in sustaining the peace treaty. However, we need to be very frank with ourselves again. The Egyptian people are yet to be educated that this was a good thing. They probably think that, that, that peace is better than war, but there is still a deep sense of hate towards Israel and hate towards Jews, which is ingrained in the Egyptian public domain. There is a degree of change. It was virulent during the Mubarak years when he basically diverted all the anger and frustration of the Egyptian people towards conspiracy theories about the Jews. And you saw this in a very nasty way in what I used to point out to my American interlocutors as I was still in the military intelligence. This is government ink on government paper. This is not free, pre uh, free press. You know, it's a relatively free press. It's controlled by the president's relatives. Uh, <laughs> uh, <let's see. laughs> but it's not mine. It's a line from an old British play. Um, uh, Sisi is trying to change this a little bit. We see less vile anti-Semitic stuff. But the point I want to make is looking towards the future, the next 40 years. I think there's an opportunity for deeper change, but we need to pursue it. There's a very interesting piece recently written in the Washington Institute for Near East Policy by a friend of mine, Joseph Browde. I've rendered a, a shorter version of it in the, J in the Jerusalem Institute website in Hebrew. The general idea is uh, we are not preordained to be hated by Arabs. Once upon a time, there were Egyptians who supported the Zionist project within the Waft, who did not think of themselves as obliged to follow some Arab fantasy. They saw, uh, they saw uh, the national movement, the liberation movement of Egypt against the British, and the national liberation movement of, of the Jews um, as potentially coexisting. You know, when, when the two Lehi assassins were hung, there were quite a lot of young Egyptians who admired them for their courage. The people who, I believe, mistakenly assassinated the man who could have been an ally of ours, uh, Lord Moyne. But that's beside the point. Um, and, and, even, and, and this is reflected in some very interesting physical things. I don't know how many of you have been to Ashdod, to uh, the monument that the Egyptians were er erected following the, the peace treaty, there was an agreement to erect one Israeli monument in Sinai, near Nativa, uh, the other side of the board, for the fallen. And the Egyptians put up a monument here in Ashdod, in Ad Halom, the point, the northernmost point of their invasion in 48. And what did they choose to put in? It's a small red granite obelisk in four languages, Hebrew, Arabic, English, and hieroglyphics. <laughs> to say, we came here as Egyptians, we died here as Egyptians, we are back home as Egyptians. Egypt, not the Arabs, can be a neighbor of a Jewish state. I think that we are at, perhaps at the beginning of something new. And that's going to be my last, well, maybe two, three, two, qu three quick points. One, I don't, we n did not pay enough attention, not here, not anywhere, to something called the EMGF. Anyone here immediately rising to the initials? The Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, established in Cairo <coughs> this February, sorry, this January, including Italy, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority for good measure. I used to advocate a vision of the three plus three, Italy, Greece, Cyprus, 
Egypt, Israel, and Jordan, the Egyptians threw in uh, three and a half, because the Palestinians are not exactly a state yet. But that's an amazing step forward in the midst of all these bad news all around us. As the more Egypt thinks of itself as a Mediterranean country in the spirit of the great Egyptian writer and thinker, Taha Hussein, the idea of mutawasatiya, mediterraneite, the more we shall find common ground. So gas is an, impl an implement of this vision, but there's more to come. Um, on the politics of the relationship, just very quickly, we, we spoke, all three of us, about the Carter blunder. Very intelligent person making a, a huge blunder because of, he misread the region. If that sounds familiar, um, think of 2334, the UN vote. Obama, oh, I should really put, you know, the <laughs> blame where it's due. John Kerry wants to settle a score with Netanyahu through a UN Security Council resolution. The Egyptians put forward, the courtesy of the Egyptian Foreign Ministry, doing their shtick, uh, put forward a draft. This, the Trump team, legally or not, that's an interesting question, calls Sisi and says, pull it. I have some, the, the, the incoming president, already president-elect, has some ideas of his own. He doesn't want them to be undermined. Pull it. What does CC do? He pulls it. And then Kerry works with New Zealand and Malaysia to reinstate it. Therefore, signaling to the entire Arab and Muslim world that Egypt cares about the Palestinians less than, Newton, than, than Malaysia or New Zealand. So to risk the stability of the most important country in the region in order to settle a score with the Israeli government, Whatever the merits of the issue gives you a sense of just how blind they were and why Sisi f uh, feels such a sense of in intimacy and common interest, not only with the Trump administration, but also within the Israeli government that shares his needs. And there's a fighting going on in Sinai, which I wish the New York Times didn't write about, which is not to say that they were actually wrong, in which... We work together. Finally, uh, towards uh, on, on, on current affairs. The Golan, what's the difference? Why are we looking to the Golan the way we do while we did what Begin did with Egypt? Well, the short and simple answer is, had the Syrians been willing to negotiate on the basis of the international border, we probably could not have held them off. We would have had a, a, a strip of land away from the Kinnad, but we could not have held them off. But they refused, <coughs> refused to do so. It was their insistent position that they should get, after 20 years of terrorism, support for Hezbollah, whatever you want, uh, 20 years of rejectionism, they would get more than the Egyptians beyond the international border. The land they took in, 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 in 48 and even in 1950, like El Hamad. And that it was, an, at, at the end of the day, an intolerable position. And as, as a result, we can argue in the opposite direction. We get to keep what we fought for. And as for the Egyptian role in Gaza, which is unfolding, I will just say that beyond the specific outcomes, and they're going to be a messy, ugly, fragile compromise of some sort because as, as you said, that's the real world we live in, and that's what we bargained for with the Zionist project, living in the real world, making real world compromises with nasty people. But I think beyond the actual results, the role of Egypt is important in and of itself. Putting forward Sisi and, he, and what he stands for as an alternative vision is to that of the Islamists of various colors is in our interests. And if in the long run, okay, Hamas fires at us from time to time, but at the end of the day, their jihadi project dies slowly, the death of long attrition, 
This is in our interest, and this is what we and the Egyptians want to see. Thank you. <coughs> yeah? Okay. Uh, Okay, um, uh, okay there's, I, I know some people have questions, but I think it's been a long evening and we've heard a lot of um, really, great, uh, really great talks um, and some uh, amazing insights from our three speakers. Um, I want to uh, remind you that um, the book by Gerald Steinberg and uh, Ziv Rabinovitz is going to be available in May, I think, is that right? Well, it's available now if you order it from Tennessee, but it will be available here in the bookstore. <laughs> Probably after Pesach. Okay, after Pesach. So Maybe stop by here and, and, and buy a copy. Um, and yeah, and it just leads me to thank our guests again, Gerald Steinberg, Dan Marie Dor, Aaron Lerman. Thank you very much. <laughs>